Hi, everyone, and welcome to Liberty Me U. We're here tonight with Dr. David Friedman. Uh, he's going to be talking about the third edition of his wonderful book, The Machinery of Freedom. Uh, many of us here have probably already read it, and Dr. Friedman needs no introduction, but for those uh, in this uh, community who might not know who he is, he's an economist, physicist, legal scholar, and libertarian theorist. He's known for his writings in market anarchist theory, but also has uh, several other excellent books, including uh, Price Theory and Intermediate Texts, Hidden Order, The Economics of Everyday Life, and what we were just talking about uh, before we started there, Law's Order, What Economics Has to Do with Law and Why It Matters. Uh, the Machinery of Freedom has been very influential within the libertarian movement in showing people how a society without a monopoly on law uh, might be, might, uh, might order itself, and it's it's been wonderful in, in as a resource text in, in for thinking about how some of these issues might be confronted, and it's been tremendously influential in my intellectual development. And I'm very excited to present to you, Dr. David Friedman. Hello, everybody. Uh, machinery is available as a Kindle on Amazon at a extremely low price since I write books mainly to spread ideas, not mainly as a source of income. Uh, in the third edition, I'm really doing two things, both of them involving ideas I've had and to some extent written about in the time since uh, the book was originally published. Machinery was published in the first edition about 40 years ago, I think the second something like 20 years ago. Uh, and there are really two sorts of material in the book. There are about four different chunks which expand on, modify, sort of fill out ideas that were in the original book. And then there are a number of other chapters uh, which do other additional things. And what I'll probably be doing tonight is trying to sketch the four chapters, then list the others, and we can see what people want to talk about. Uh, and I start out with what I think of as a positive account of rights. Most people think of rights either as a moral category or as a legal category. That I have a right not to be killed either means it is wrong for you to kill me or it means that if you kill me, you'll get arrested and bad things will happen to you. And I think it's useful to see rights in neither of those terms, but rather to see them as a description of how human beings behave. Not only human beings, we'll see in a minute, but human beings in particular. So that's why I think of it as a positive account. And I want to start out by pointing out that property rights not only are not a creation of government, as people often claim, they predate our species. That there is a form of property rights that exists in quite a lot of non-human species. And I want to argue that when you understand that, it will help you to understand rights in general among humans. And the property rights among mostly birds and fishes are what are referred to as territorial behavior. And the basic way it works is that an animal somehow marks a territory which it's claiming and turns a switch in its brain, metaphorically speaking, which commits itself to fight more and more desperately against a trespasser of its own species the deeper he comes into the claim territory. And what's driving the, the mechanism is that a fight to the death is usually a loss for both sides. Uh, unless the trespasser is much bigger and stronger than the defender, uh, by the time the defender is dead, the trespasser is going to be hurt. And therefore, if the trespasser knows that the defender will fight to the death, it pays the trespasser to back off. And most of the time, not always, it works so that in territorial animals, you actually get an effective claiming of territory by individuals uh, within the species. Uh, and I want to claim that rights in humans amount to a much more elaborate version of the same, of the same mechanism. And I find it useful to tell the following story to try to illustrate my point. Uh, imagine that you are living in some suburban neighborhood with a not very well organized uh, government, uh, not very efficient or reliable. 
And one day your neighbor calls you over to the fence and he tells you that he's decided that taking his trash to the dump is a real pain. So from now on, he's going to dump it over the fence into your, into your yard. And when you finish uh, collecting your thoughts and, and suggest to him that he ought not to do that, he calmly explains to you that getting the local authorities to do anything about it will be a great deal of trouble, take you a lot of time and effort to get them to move and convince them that it's really his trash and so forth. Uh, and that it's less trouble for you to just take his trash and dump it, take it to the dump. But he's willing to offer you a better alternative. If you'll pay him 10 bucks a month, you'll agree not to do it. And the question is why you turn down this very generous offer. Uh, you correctly calculate that retaliating against him is going to cost you more than $10 a month. And yet I predict with some confidence that you aren't going to agree to, to his extortion. Uh, and the reason is that you, like the bird or fish, have drawn certain lines. These are not necessarily not always geographical lines, but there are certain lines such that you have somehow emotionally committed yourself that if someone crosses those lines, you will fight him harder than the amount at stake seems to be worth. Not infinitely hard. Somebody uh, might violate what you see as your rights and you might back down because you're afraid you'll get killed if you don't. Uh, we don't all fight muggers. But you are willing to fight muggers or the equivalent, even if fighting them costs you $30 and giving in costs you $10. And the reason you're committed to that strategy, of course, is that if other members of your species realize you're so committed, they don't threaten to dump trash over your fence or in other ways violate your rights. So I want to claim that the system of rights in human society is simply an elaborate network of mutually recognized commitment strategies. Uh, and that that explains a good deal about how human societies work. In particular, it answers a puzzle that's implicit in Thomas Hobbes' famous description of the state of nature as a war of each against all. Uh, and Hobbes says the solution is to have a sovereign, an all-powerful king. But the question is, how do you get it? Because after all, once you've set up your government to enforce rights, the people in that government are just people. They're acting like anybody else. The fact that somebody is wearing a policeman's uniform doesn't make him enforce the law. The fact that words are written in books doesn't make people enforce the law. What changes in the incentives that individuals have that give you a peaceful civil order? And the answer, I think, comes down to a different structure of such commitment strategy. Uh, furthermore, this way of looking at rights also fills out a point I made in the first edition where I asked the question of what, why do we call some things governments and not others? Why do we say, after all, everything you can think of that governments do have been done by some private organization at some time in, in history? So what's the difference? And the definition I offered there was that a government was an agency of legitimized coercion. And I tried to explain that I was using both words in special senses, which I tried to, to fill out in, in that chapter. You can go back and look at the the chapter if you like. Uh, but I think I can now explain more precisely that the government is an agency against which we drop the commitment strategies that protect our rights against violations by other people. That usually, going back many steps, when I say you have a right to, some, to something in this sense, what I really mean is other people will find that it is not in their interest uh, to violate. That's the real substance of rights is some set of behavior, in this case, your commitment strategy, such as it's not in other people's interest to steal from you, kill you, or whatever. It usually isn't. Nothing, nothing is perfect. So that's the first chunk, what I think of as the positive account of rights. And I think it helps explain human societies and helps explain how governments are different. And then an anarchist is somebody who supports a society which has no agency of legitimized coercion, which has no organization which can do things that would be treated as rights violation if anybody else did. Second part is a discussion of the fact that the legal system I proposed in Machinery of Freedom is less original than I thought it was. That it turned, and I came to know this partly because one of my current projects is a book on legal systems very different from ours. 
coming out of a seminar I teach on that on that subject. And I've looked at quite a wide range of legal systems going back to Periclean Athens and ancient China, uh, up to the Amish and the modern gypsies and various other people. And it turns out that one very common historical pattern is a decentralized legal system, which is driven entirely by decentralized private action, not by a, a government. Uh, and I usually refer to that as a feud system, uh, which is a little bit misleading. And I should say feud and feudal have nothing to do with each other. They're unrelated words that happen to sound similar. But the basic logic of a feud system is pretty simple. Uh, and it's, again, the human version of my territorial behavior. The logic of a feud system is that if you wrong me, I threaten to harm you unless you compensate me. That's, that, that's the guts of how a feud system works. And there are a number of requirements for that system to work. The first system, the first requirement is some mechanism such that right makes might. Some mechanism such that when you have really wronged me, my threat is more believable than when you have. Because otherwise, what I'm calling a feud system just becomes extortion. I say, give me money or I'll harm you. Uh, so we need some reason, some, some way in which my threats against you are believable if you've really wronged me and not if, if you haven't. And different societies do it in different ways. The feud system I first studied that I actually discuss in the second edition of Machinery is the legal system of saga period Iceland, which was set up a little more than a thousand years ago. Uh, and in that system, they had a court system. They had a law. What they didn't have was any government to enforce the court verdicts. So what happened was that when you thought someone wronged you, you charged him in a court of law. The law gave a verdict. If the verdict was that he owed you 100 ounces of silver uh, as, as a compensation for what he had done to you, he either paid or he didn't pay. If he didn't pay, you went back to the court, which outlawed him. Outlawing meant it was now legal to kill him and tortious. Uh, you could be sued for defending him. Once he had been outlawed, all of your neighbors knew that the reason you were coming after him was not that you were an evil extortionist, but that he had failed to abide by a court verdict. And the result was that your friends would be willing to support you and his friends wouldn't be willing to support him. There's a much simpler version of the same system currently functioning in England. And this is the legal system of the Roman child gypsies, who are the, I think, largest gypsy group in modern day England. And there's an interesting book that has a chapter describing them. Uh, and in that system, if you wrong me, I threaten to beat you up unless you compensate me. And the reason that right makes might is it's a small enough society so that the other people in our community can tell whether you really wronged me or not. And if they think that you're in the right, your friends will back you and my friends won't back me if they think I'm in the right the other way around. So the result is that if you did wrong me, you either compensate or leave town. So that's a primitive version uh, of what the Icelanders had a thousand years ago. Second requirement for a feud system to work is some mechanism for protecting the weak, some mechanism such that people who don't have the resources of physical force to actually injure someone who's wronged them can nonetheless get protected. And there are at least two mechanisms I'm familiar with for doing this in a decentralized way. Uh, the Icelandic system solution was very simple, and that was that damage claimants were transferable. So if you had wronged me, say you killed my son, and if I could win a case against you, you would owe me 200 ounces of silver as damage payment. But if I tried to win a case against you, you and your friends would beat me up before I got to the court. So it's not going to work. Uh, I'm an elderly man. I have no more sons. What I do is I transfer my claim to my neighbor who's a tough guy with four sons who went a Viking when they, were you, when they were young and he's got lots of friends and allies and he enforces it and he collects 200 ounces of silver and maybe he gives me 100. That would be depend on the terms of the agreement between us. But the basic point is that by wronging me, you give me a claim, I can transfer that claim. If I can't enforce it myself, I transfer it to someone else who can. And that means that you will suffer for wronging me, which is the essential requirement for a feud system to work to, to enforce rights. Uh, another thing you need for the system to work is a way of ending feuds, that people who hear you talk about feuds imagine feuds going forever, on forever. They, uh, 
imagine the fictional version of the Hatfield and McCoy story instead of the real version of the Hatfield and McCoy story, which we can discuss if people are curious. But in fact, at least the few systems that I'm aware of have mechanisms for ending it. And the simplest mechanism in the Icelandic system is simply paying damages. That, uh, you know, you killed somebody, happens. This is a pretty violent society. Uh, being Vikings is one of the available professions for young men. You get into a quarrel, there happens to be an ax at hand and bad things happen. That's all right. You pay your wear guilt. You pay the damage payment the court assesses and it's all over. So you only get a return killing if you refuse to do that. Another mechanism was arbitration. So that quite commonly, instead of going to a court, the two sides in a dispute would agree to pick some neutral third party who they trusted uh, and accept his 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 verdict. Uh, and both of those both of those work. Uh, the final requirement, and the one which is getting more nearly relevant issues with the system I described in machinery, is that the the, the economies of scale, the advantage of big over small stop at a low enough level so there are lots of players. What you don't want is a situation where there are one or two or three coalitions which together can overawe everybody else so that they back down because then they may reestablish a government. Uh, and in the systems I'm familiar with at least, well, Iceland, the Icelandic system lasted for a bit over 300 years. So it did, did better than our system has so far, but it eventually broke down. And one possible explanation is that things had changed in a way such that the number of players was becoming too small in effect, so that you had powerful coalitions. There are other possible explanations, but, but that is a, a important requirement. And one of the points that I discussed in machinery was that the anarcho-capitalist system I described might be unstable if you ended up with a very small number of rights enforcement agencies, because if there are only two or three or four of them, they might get together, form a cartel, refuse to allow people to shift agencies, and reinvent government on the grounds that they might find that robbery was more profitable than business. So for the system to work, you want a reasonably substantial number. And the same thing I think is true is true in this case. Uh, uh, Somalia, the traditional Somali system, northern Somali system, was a feud system. And that was one where people pre-committed to coalitions. So you have a group of people who have agreed that if one of them is wrong, they'll all help him and have agreed that they will then share the damage payment he gets. And that if he wrongs somebody, they'll share paying the damage payments. More complicated, but that's a simple version. And what keeps it competitive is that the larger such a group gets, the harder it is to run it. The more there are internal conflicts and strains within that group, different people who want to be boss and so forth. Uh, but so you need some reason why the system uh, stays competitive. So as I say, the second thing that I added, I didn't know very much about feud systems when I wrote machinery, but it turns out that really what I set up was a modern society equivalent of a feud system, a system in which the use of force was decentralized, in which in principle rights were enforced by decentralized force, but in practice violence rarely happened because it's normally in the interest of people to make arrangements to settle their disputes without fighting instead of, instead of with them. All right, the next thing that I add came out of the one good book review that Machinery got. And my definition of a good book review is not one that I like, but one that makes me think. And the one good review Machinery got in that sense was done by Jim Buchanan, who was later a colleague of mine at VPI, a prominent economist. And Jim, it was a reasonably friendly review, but he pointed out that there was a hole in my argument because in the first edition, which is what he was responding to, I sketched out what would happen if you had two rights enforcement agencies which disagreed about what the law ought to be. And in my hypothetical case, the customers of one agency were in favor of capital punishment for murder and the customers of the other agency were against it. And how do they decide whether to agree on a private court for disputes between them? I assume that most of you have read the book, but the basic framework is you've got private firms that sell the service of rights enforcement and settling disputes. Each pair of such firms finds it in their interest to contract in advance on a private court in order not to have to fight each other if there's a dispute between their customers. Uh, and the private courts are then making 
and the law is whatever the agencies choose to buy, which the courts will then provide. So how do you decide whether to have death penalty, pro-death penalty, or anti-death penalty court? And my answer was that each firm finds out how much its customers want their preferred rule. And if it turns out that the anti-death penalty firm could raise its rates enough to make, say, an extra $100,000 a year, if it could guarantee its customers that there would be a non-death penalty court in disputes with the other firm. And if the other firm found that they could only raise their rates 50,000 if they guaranteed the other way around, then I said there'd be a side payment between them uh, and uh, you would end up with the more valuable legal rule measured in that sense. And what Jim pointed out was that I never made it clear what the default was. What was the rule if you don't agree? Or to put it differently, does the pro-death penalty agency have to pay the anti to get a pro-death penalty court? Or does it only have to turn down offers from the anti in order to keep a, a pro-death penalty court? And that's a real, a, real, a real issue that I had, speaking in the jargon of economics, I had solved the allocational problem, but not the distributional problem. I had determined what laws you would have, but not who would pay for them. Uh, so I have a chapter in the new edition in which I try to deal with that question and in which I argue that underlying the bargaining game I had described, there's an implicit mutual threat game that if after all we can't bargain to agreement, we'll end up shooting each other. And in that game, how good one is at applying violence might affect how well you do. Uh, and in fact, I argue that in some sense, all societies have mutual threat games lying underneath them, that in any society, there's always the potential for people who feel they're getting a bad enough deal to have a revolution or engage in civil disorder or civil disobedience in one way or another to work outside the framework to try to force the result they want. Uh, and that once a society is established, the mutual threat game usually becomes unimportant, that everybody knows that fighting is worse than not fighting, and therefore there's a tendency to say, we will start with whatever we've agreed to in the past and then bargain from there. But that when you're starting out, that might not be the case. And the reason that matters for my analysis is that even if, as I argued in machinery, there aren't large economies of scale in enforcing rights, if the normal business of the rights enforcement agency works as well with 100,000 customers with 10 million customers, which I thought it likely it would, there might be economies of scale in threatening other agencies. And if so, you might end up with larger agencies as a result of the problem Jim had raised, and that might undercut the stability of my system. So if you want the full detail, I see I'm approaching, the, not quite at the half hour point, but I'm getting close enough, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but the book is out there, you can read it. If you're too cheap to pay, it's two ninety five for the book. Drafts of the chapters, I think, are still up on my web page, and you can read, read those. All right, the last thing that I added to was the problem of national defense. That in machinery, I, I described national defense as the hard problem for stateless societies. And the reason it's a hard problem is that national defense is what economists call a public good. A public good is a good where the producer cannot control who gets it. So if I blow up a, a, a nuclear missile that's heading for my city, uh, there's no way that I can prevent my neighbors from benefiting by what I've done. And that means that as somebody put it a long time ago, everybody's business is nobody's business. That with a public good, an ordinary private good, if I produce something valuable, I can go to people and say, if you don't pay, you don't get it. Public good, I can't control who gets it, so I don't have that mechanism. So there is no reliable way of being sure that if a public good is worth producing, it'll get produced. Nonetheless, public goods are sometimes produced privately. Uh, radio broadcasts, for example, are pretty much a pure public good and are produced privately. Uh, but that means that to produce a public good privately, you've got to find some clever way, some kludge, as it were, by which you can pay its cost. And so I have a chapter in which I sketch out my current version of the kludgy way in which you might produce national defense for a stateless, stateless society.
And it was sort of fun because I based the kludge on a bunch of different things. It's partly based on the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It's partly based on a very strange Rudyard Kipling short story. Uh, it's partly based on the Society for Creative Anachronism, which is a group that does medieval and Renaissance stuff for fun, including fighting with swords and shields, in sometimes with armies of more than a thousand people aside, uh, on open source software and a number of other things. Let me start with the Kipling short story. Uh, the story is called The Army of a Dream. You find it online. Uh, the narrator has returned to England from a long absence, and a friend of his who is a military officer is explaining to him how things have changed. And the basic change in the story is that the chief sport in England is no longer either cricket or football. It's now military exercises. It's now war games at a scale of an inch to an inch, with people maneuvering around and referees saying you would have won the battle if it was a real battle. And that's what school kids do. There's a neat little bit describing a bunch of, I would guess, about 12-year-olds who call in a military officer to be the referee when one of them says, I've beaten the other guy. So it's quite a neat story of that sort. It's not a stateless society. It's clear that the government is sort of interwoven with the system, but that what's really driving it are mainly social pressures. It's mainly a whole lot of people learning to be soldiers for the fun of it and for getting status and for reasons like that, and only secondarily because the government has various ways of rewarding you for, for doing it. And the result is a system like the Swiss system, uh, but with much less, with, without the mandatory training, uh, in which in Kipling's fictional story, you can raise, England can raise a huge army if it has to very quickly. Uh, and at the very end of the story, Kipling begins to remember that the military officer who has been describing all of this died several years earlier. And the officer turns the side of his head that he'd been keeping away from Kipling, and Kipling sees the wound that he died from. And he wakes up and realizes it was all the army of the dream. So it's a weird and neat story. Uh, but it suggests to me the general idea that you could have a society in which you got a whole lot of volunteer labor for military purposes really cheaply because people were doing it for fun. And that appealed to me because I've been involved in Society for Creative Anachronism for God, 40 years or more now. And there, you know, every, every August uh, in private campground a little north of Pittsburgh, you've got battles with something like a thousand men aside. And it's true their weapons wouldn't be very useful in modern warfare since they're fighting with swords and shields and spears and the swords are made of rattan, not steel so you don't want to get really killed. But that's a whole bunch of people who spent a lot of time and energy training themselves in medieval combat, and they've done it for the fun of it. And they've paid the cost of their armor and their equipment and everything else. So I thought, what if you had a society where people liked the society and felt sort of patriotic, and as in Kipling's story, there were a lot of people who did war games for the fun of it. And it then occurred to me that there's another pattern in, in, in our society, which is a good deal closer to real warfare and involves many, many more people than SCA does, and that's paintball. Uh, I've got some figures in the chapter that I picked up off the web, but the number of people involved in paintball each year is, I think, more than a million. Uh, the amount of money spent on is, I think, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's getting towards the point, and of course, paintball can actually be used for military training. In fact, I think, though I am not certain, the military does use it for some forms of so what I was then imagining was a society in which you had a small professional cadre of, of military officers paid by charity, and then a very, very large militia consisting of different groups of people who trained uh, at real combat for the fun of it, who had games which consisted of battles between them in which they're firing blanks, but you've got referees of some sort or some mechanism or other to figure out who would have won. Uh, maybe the professional officers have a sideline in refereeing and in organizing these games and in standardizing things so the different units can talk to each other. Uh, and then, if there is a war, uh, you have a whole large number of trained people. The officers become the sort of upper levels of the, of the military hierarchy, uh, and you've gotten yourself a really cheap army. Uh, the way I thought about it is this goes back to my understanding of the Second Amendment in the U.S., because the Second Amendment of the Constitution, as I see it, 
was the solution to a problem that people in the 18th century were worried about. And the problem was that a professional army could beat an amateur army. But a professional army was a very dangerous thing to have. Because as some of you may know, in the 17th century, there were two English civil wars. The first English civil war was parliament against the king. And parliament won it. And what won it for parliament was the new model army commanded by Oliver Cromwell. And the second civil war was Oliver Cromwell and the new model army against everybody else. And as Churchill puts it in his history of the English speaking people, the new model army beat the lot. And Oliver Cromwell was the military dictator of England for the rest of his life. The Lord Protector was the, the title he used. So the question was, how could you have an army good enough to defend yourself without having an army that could take over? And I think the Second Amendment solution is that you have a very, very large militia and a very small professional army. And the militia makes up in size for its low quality, and the professionals uh, can make sure the militia works together, they can establish common rules and such, but if they try to take over, they're going to be outgunned 100 to 1 or 1,000 to 1. And the system I'm describing has exactly the same attractions, that getting your low quality soldiers cheap doesn't lower the cost of defense if you're paying half as much, but it takes twice as many of them. But if they're free, it does lower the cost. And what I'm describing is a way in which the mass of the army would be working for free, because from their standpoint, it would be their hobby, their game, as well as their patriotic contribution to defending their society. Uh, and just as with the Second Amendment, since the professionals are enormously outnumbered and outgunned, they're not in a position to take over. And since the militias are a whole lot of different groups connected by different things, you know, some of them will be religious groups and some of them will be hobbyists and some of them will be a local town and things of that sort, there really isn't a mechanism that will let you take over and, and reestablish a government. So that was the sort of the basic idea. Now, one problem is your hobbyists, not very many hobbyists can afford tanks, but that's all right because every April 15th, when we have the holiday parade, our Liberty Day parade. Uh, in that parade, you see a, a squad of people um, who work for Apple Computer, and they're escorting some robot tanks made by Apple Computer flying Apple's banner. And a little farther down on the parade, there's the squad from Microsoft with a cloud of drones operated by Microsoft software flying above them. Uh, that is what I'm imagining is that one of the ways in which you'll get some of the more expensive items that you don't need as many of is that companies want the reputation of being good patriotic people. You observe today companies do a lot of things where they're trying to improve their image and that one way of improving your image is to say if you want to volunteer to be part of our little militia group we'll give you some time off and we'll pay for your toys and, and you'll march in the parade flying our banner. So that's what I was trying to, now I should say I'm not claiming this will work. Uh, I, I'm not strong on prophecy. What I'm claiming is that it describes a way, in one way, one of multiple ways, in which one might be able to mount an effective defense uh, to a stateless society without taxations and conscription and things of that sort. So that's sort of, I've sketched uh, what are most of the chapters of the first, sec first new section. The book has two new sections. But the first section is mostly things that are filling out ideas that I started in the original book. Uh, the second section and a little bit of the first section includes other things. And I thought I would just list them and people, we, we can then go on to question and answer and people can tell me what they want to talk about or they can ask about what I've just been talking about. So one of the things I talk about is market failure. But I think the term means and why, although market failure is an argument against the free market, it's a stronger argument against the alternatives. I have one chapter which sketches my reasons for being unpersuaded by Ayn Rand's attempt to derive ought from is, to show uh, why, people, why certain rights exist, why people should behave in certain ways. I have another chapter which sketches my own view of moral philosophy. People who are really interested in that subject uh, might be better off reading Michael Humer's book on intuitionism because Michael's a very bright guy and he's a professional philosopher and his position is pretty close to the same as mine. Uh, I have one chapter which is on what I think of as misuses of externality 
And the two examples that I'm discussing are population concerns, which really peaked about 40 years ago, and current climate, global warming concerns. And the point I'm making is that in principle, if I'm doing something that imposes costs on other people, uh, I may do it even if the, on net, the costs to them are greater than the benefits to me. And that's an argument for having some sort of regulation or pollution tax or things of that sort. But that in cases like population or global warming, you're looking at both positive and negative effects. Warming will make things, make winters milder as well as summers harsher. It'll lengthen growing seasons as well as causing sea level to rise and so forth. The size of these effects is very hard to estimate because they're spread out over a long period of time and we don't really know what human beings will do for the next hundred years. The result is that if you think global warming is a bad thing, you can add up your guess of the effects, making high estimates of the bad effects and low estimates of the good effects and say, aha, I've got a scientific proof it's bad, we've got to have a carbon tax. And if you think it's a good thing, you can do the same thing the other way around. And I got into that argument uh, quite a long time ago, I guess it would be again about 40 years ago, maybe a little more than that by now, uh, 45 years ago, with regard to population, that I wrote a piece on population in which I tried to actually add up the net effect on other people of having one more child. And I concluded that I could not sign the sum. I couldn't tell whether if you added up good effects and bad effects, the sum was positive or negative. And yet a whole lot of people were absolutely confident it was a bad effect and that therefore something urgent had to be done to, to hold down population. The predictions those people made were uniformly false. Uh, from then to now, per capita calorie consumption has gone up, not down in the poor parts of the world. Uh, there have been there has been no mass famine except for political ones when there was a civil war going on and one side tried to keep food from getting to the other. Uh, I guess you could, I, there's mass famine in China, but that was also a political famine, although with only one side involved, that was the result of the Great Leap Forward. But basically the predictions of the, of the population catastrophists all turned out to be wrong. And that makes me uh, more willing to apply the same approach to global warming, uh, that my best guess is that warming is happening. My best guess is that it's at least in part due to greenhouse gases emitted by humans, but I can't see any good reason to think that warming on the scale suggested by current work is on net going to have bad effects. It might have good effects, it might have bad effects. All of the arguments take for granted that it will have very large bad effects and I'm not convinced. So I have a chapter discussing that. Uh, and then I have a chapter discussing bringing up children because that's something I've actually done. Uh, and it's really arguing for unschooling for the approach to educating children, which I describe as throwing books at them and seeing which ones stick. So the two kids of my present marriage uh, were unschooled. They had no curriculum. They did not have assignments. They did not have homework. We talked with them about interesting things and got them interested in stuff. And we we're happy at how that worked. I don't guarantee it'll work for everybody, but at least it worked for us. Uh, I then have a final chapter, which I think I call Welcome to the Future. And that chapter is about the implications of online uh, activity and especially of encryption from the standpoint of libertarians. Because as a number of people pointed out, in particular people associated with what were called the cypherpunks back a few decades ago, uh, encryption has the potential for creating a society where you have a high enough level of privacy that you cannot be controlled because nobody can tell what you're doing unless you want them to. That's a very simple description of potential implications of public key encryption. Uh, and I like to say not entirely seriously that what we've discovered with the publicity of what the NSA has been doing over the past few years is that the people at the NSA read my articles, decided they didn't like that future and set out to stop it. Now, my guess is they didn't have to read my articles. I think NSA had lots of smart people, but that the technologies have the potential for producing a very decentralized and free society, sort of an online version of anarcho-capitalism, I discussed that. So in addition to all of this, there are a few things I haven't mentioned. And also, as with the first two editions, each section has a poem to go with it, and you can go look at it, and you will find uh, a one poem, which is sort of a put down of Thomas Hobbes for the 
uh, first new section and another poem, which is really a put down of people who are sure that everyone who disagrees with them must be a fool uh, for the second section. And I think that's about it at this point uh, that I'd be happy to stop talking for a moment and see what other people would like to ask about. Thank you so much. All right, we do have a, a bunch of questions already. If you'd like to ask a question, you can ask in the questions tab to the right in text, or if you'd like to come on video, you can click video chatting up above the chat window and then click start your webcam. Uh, our first question is from Fu. He asks, do you believe that nuclear mutually assured destruction is partly or mostly an artifact of megastates? If so, why? It's a good question, not one that I've thought about uh, very much. Uh, in a sense, mutually assured destruction is a sort of a exaggerated version of territorial behavior. That is of the, Id of the idea of saying, don't do something because even if I lose, I can make the cost to you high enough so you don't want to, want to do it. Uh, mutually assured destruction worked. That is to say, we never did blow ourselves up, so and that's in, in some sense a, a test. Uh, I guess the sense in which, the only sense I can see in which it's associated with megastates is that in a world of many states, if A and B beat each other up, that weakens them with regard to C, D, and E. Whereas in a world where there are only two great powers, each one might plausibly believe, if I can only smash him, what's left of me will still be enough to to rule the world. So I guess in that sense, but it's not just mutually assured destruction, in that sense, I think a two-power world is probably more dangerous than a multi-power multi -power world. And in that sense, the fact that we are, I think, moving to a multi-power world strikes me as on the whole a, a good thing, not a, not a bad thing. All right, our next question is from Dave. Dave asks, you know, without tort law, I guess top-down tort law in place, is it possible to engage in the truly voluntary Kosian bargaining that's necessary for efficient outcomes? And he, uh, he clarifies that a bit more. Yes, for example, what happens in a case where it is far cheaper for a co coercer to cause harm than for the victim to prevent it if there is no prior all allocation of rights? But I guess my answer is the answer that I really started with when I was explaining uh, the positive account of rights, that even though it is cheaper for you to hurt me than for me to retaliate against you, it is in my interest, if I can do it, to arrange in advance that I will retaliate against you, because then you won't hurt me. Uh, and in the system I described, the way I do that is by being a customer of a rights enforcement agency. The rights enforcement agency won't have any customers unless it protects their rights. And so it has a strong market incentive, even when it's expensive, to go after people who injure, who injure its customers. So that's why you need commitment strategies of some sort, which probably I should have included when I was giving my requirements for a feud system. You need ways of, 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 of committing yourself. Um, and I think real societies, they do it in different ways. That in the Icelandic case, on the one hand, you've got the mechanism of transferring your claim to somebody more powerful than you. You also have the fact that being a wimp is shameful in that society, and that therefore, if I am somebody who's got enough resources to retaliate, uh, I'm going to be reluctant to back down even if retaliation is dangerous, because I will lose a lot of status if I, if I do that. All right, our next question is from Wesley. He's going to come on air to ask. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, this question is regarding kind of private courts and uh, the way that dispute resolution would happen when you have two parties that can at least agree to go to the same dispute resolution organization, but in order to discover the truth and to reach a resolution to the dispute, they need to bring in third parties to the uh, exchange who weren't directly harmed or involved in the harm, so to bear witness as to what happened. But where do you, how would you incentivize, first of all, if you can't use subpoenas and perjury, uh, the witnesses to actually come to the dispute resolution and second of all to be truthful when they're at the dispute resolution? That's a good question. Uh, I guess part of the answer is that you could buy options. That is to say, if I'm running a private court or a private rights enforcement agency, uh, 
uh, I could go to all my customers and say, look, charge you 10 bucks an, uh, a year less if you agree that if you are the witness to any of case that we're involved with, you will be willing for a reasonable per hour fee to come and testify. <laughs> Beyond that, there are certainly ways in which you can enforce rules against perjury. You can require people to bond themselves. You can say you're giving this testimony, and if the testimony turns out to be true, we'll give you $1,000. But by the way, we're expecting you to deposit $500, which will forfeit if it turns out the testimony is not true. So it doesn't seem to me that those would be in, insuperable uh, problems in, in such a system. And it seems to me that they're probably less serious than some of the problems we have with our present system, which is that a whole lot of testimony is perjured testimony purchased by the prosecution in the form of we will let you off lightly on what we've got you for if you just happen to if it just happens that your cellmate confessed to the crime we wanted to get him for uh, when he was, was a cellmate of yours. So, uh, I mean, no systems are perfect, but, but it would seem to me that if you are willing to say, essentially, we will pay for testimony and you have to commit yourself to lose the money if the testimony is false or even to forfeit money if the testimony is false, uh, you ought to be able to manage reasonable respect for, for handling. Now, I should say at a considerable uh, digression from this, uh, one of the issues I've discussed elsewhere is the effects on society of surveillance technology. Because one of the ways in which the world is changing is that a whole lot more of what happens now ends up recorded. And that as that technology gets better and better, you are going to be closer and closer to a world where the disputes are only about the legal status of what happened and not about what actually happened. And if that happens, then the importance of your witnesses is going to come somewhat, somewhat lower. So if yeah. people are interested, uh, I discuss that in my book, Future Imperfect, which like a number of my other books, you can read for free on the web if you don't feel like buying a printed copy. Thank you, Wesley. All right, our next question is from Jason. Uh, Jason asks, have you considered writing fiction similar to uh, Heinlein's The Moon is a Harsh Mistress? Uh, I've published two novels. Uh, I am not nearly as good a writer as Heinlein, unfortunately, uh, and I don't, I don't really feel tempted to write a novel that is set in an anarcho-capitalist society, and, and I'm certainly not tempted to write a novel whose purpose is to argue for my political views. That my first novel, which was published by Bain, commercially published, my protagonist is from what I think of as a semi-stateless society, a society loosely based on saga period Iceland, although it's a fictional background. Uh, but the book isn't really about the superiority of that society, and you don't actually see anything about dispute resolution in that society because most of the action is happening elsewhere. What I do try to suggest in the book implicitly is that different forms of social organization have different advantages and disadvantages, and that in that book you've got my protagonist society, You've got a society loosely based on early Norman England, and you've got a society loosely based on the sort of Roman, Byzantine, maybe Abbasid empires, on various large empires. And I'm trying to imply that each of them has certain strengths and weaknesses, that my protagonist's problem is that he doesn't have a draft, he doesn't have feudal inferiors who owe him their services, he doesn't have tax revenue, and yet he has to raise an army. And so he faces various constraints in doing that and solves them in various ways, which I have some fun with. On the other hand, I contrast him to the best general on the other side. And the best general on the other side is technically as good a general as he is, but much less original. And the reason he's much less original is that somebody as original as my protagonist in the Imperial Army would have gotten hanged long before he became a general, because he would have done what was right instead of what the book said to do, essentially. And that's sort of a deliberate, I never say this explicitly, but hopefully a perceptive reader will realize that that's part of what's going on. That, that, that on the one hand, the decentralized society has much more room for sort of individual initiative and originality and such, even though it has certain problems that my protagonist really can't afford to seriously lose a battle. Because if many of his soldiers get killed, nobody's going to come next time. So he has got to fight a war of maneuver in which what he almost always is trying to do is to put the enemy army in a position where if they don't surrender, they will die of hunger or thirst. And in fact, one of the 
people I dedicated that book to is the author of a wonderful book called Alexander the Great and the Logistics of the Macedonian Army, which is exploring Alexander's campaigns from the standpoint of the problem of keeping the army alive. So that my, my second novel also explores various ideas, but it isn't, there, there, there aren't any stateless societies in it. It's other things that I'm, that I'm looking at. That, that one was published as a Kindle on Amazon. It's called Salamander. First one's called Harold. Salamander's a better novel. I think I learned something in the process of going from one to the other. Uh, Harold was marketed by Bain as a fantasy, but it isn't really a fantasy because there's no magic. It's really a historical novel with made up history, whereas Salamander really is a fantasy. I like both of them, so people, people can read them and decide for themselves. And I, I've put a link to the Amazon page for Harold in the chat there, so if you're interested in that, you can click on that and go get it. Um, Dave Aiello asks, uh, what are your thoughts on Humer's common sense defense of anarcho-capitalism as opposed to a purely consequentialist defense? It's a good question. Uh, I read the first half of Humer's book, uh, The Problem of Political Authority, in which he, as a professional philosopher, dealt with essentially all of the arguments that are used to justify having an agency of legitimized coercion. He's really looking at the same question I'm looking at. Why is it that people feel governments are entitled to do things nobody else is? And I think he does a pretty satisfactory job of demolishing a whole bunch of the arguments. And he then ends up with really only one argument at the end, which is if we don't do it, terrible things will happen. And that's a, not an absurd argument. It convinces a lot of people. However, I never finished the book. Uh, I don't I don't find it that interesting to read stuff I, that I already agree with, so to speak. Uh, so though I was interested in seeing how he dealt with the philosophical argument, I probably ought to finish it because I say Mike's a bright guy. He's one of my favorite fellow libertarian academics. Uh, but uh, and let's say I think I, uh, given that he's sort of trying to persuade people of things I'm already I already agree with, uh, I didn't feel a strong incentive. I read his book on intuitionism because it was pretty clear that his basic approach to moral philosophy was the same as mine, and I was hoping that he could do a better job than I could of rebutting some of the arguments against it. And he thinks he does, but I don't think he does. I think that there is a, a counter-argument, which I'm not entirely happy with my answers to, and I'm not entirely happy with his answers to it either, but that would be another, another long discussion. We should have you back for that discussion sometime. Uh, David Hudson asks, What's your opinion on the origin of states? Why does it seem to be inevitable across the world? Huh. It's an interesting question. Inevitable is probably an overstatement because after all, there have been quite a lot of stateless societies that Northern Somalia was really a stateless society up to about 1960. Uh, it was theoretically under British rule, but if you read the stuff written at the time, I think Britain wasn't really running it, although it was one of the people involved in things. Uh, I think the Roman child are still really a stateless society, as are the Kali, a different Jew, a different gypsy group in, in Finland. Uh, but certainly most people through at least recorded history have been under states of one sort or another. And I don't know. One possible answer is that we've been in societies where the economies of scale are such that decentralized systems, eventually one of the agencies gets bigger than the others and takes over. And that depends really on whether economies of scale go up to that size. And the economy in general, non-economists tend to assume that big firms always have an advantage over small firms. And economists don't, because if you look at real world economies, it turns out that most of the time the equilibrium of a market has many firms, not only one or two firms. It's just that large firms are more visible than small firms, and so you tend to overestimate how many large, how much of the economy is, is, is large firms. Uh, so, yeah, no, there's a sense in which the strongest argument against my position is the one that Nozick made in the one time I had an encounter with him at a Libertarian Party gathering many, many years ago. Uh, I, I was giving a talk on Nozick's book, and Nozick was in the audience, so that was sort of fun. And he didn't try to defend the argument he made in the book, which I was criticizing. His point was, if what you describe works, why don't we see it? Uh, and I guess the best answer I've come up to that with that, which isn't entirely satisfactory, to say, suppose we were having this conversation a couple hundred years ago, and somebody had a sketch of a really weird society. It was, it was a society in which practically everybody could vote, even women, in which men and women and blacks and whites all had the same rights, 
in which governments taxed and spent about 40% of the national income. Uh, it was a kind of society that had never existed in the history of the world. Clearly, it can never happen. And yet, that's the normal form of organization for developed societies at present. So I guess all I can really say is that conditions change. Uh, they're changing faster now than in the past due to technological change. I don't know that what I want is going to become possible. I'd say I'm not in the prophecy business. But I think that sketching out what societies without government would look like and how they could work is a useful exercise. Because with luck, we may have circumstances that things happen. I think the most likely way to happen at the moment is online rather than in real space, for reasons that I've discussed in a number of places before. But if you get enough of life online, you then have a situation where individuals are very mobile. Because all of your friends and all of your job you can take with you wherever you go, because you're all you're dealing with all of them over the internet rather than in real space. And in that world, it doesn't matter that much if governments are territorial sovereigns, because they still have to compete for taxpayers. Uh, another bit I like to quote from C. Northcott Parkinson, who was a British academic who wrote humorous essays making serious points. And somewhere he has a comment that the productive people of the world have discovered by long and bitter experience that they will usually have to pay about 10% of their income to some gangster feudal lord or Department of Internal Revenue. It matters a little what you call it. When the rates get higher than that, the Israelites start looking at the atlas. There may be better places to be than Egypt. Uh, now, he was optimistic about the rates. Uh, it goes higher than 10%, unfortunately. But the basic point, I think, is that the more mobile people are, the less effective control governments have over them, uh, and that current technologies are pushing us towards a substantially more mobile society than we ever had before. So do you have a lot of hope for Bitcoin and other blockchain-related technologies? I mean, certainly uh, Tim May, who I think uh, was very much influenced by you, uh, kind of envisioned the, the crypto anarchy in which we kind of take the state down through technology. Well, Tim, of course, did, didn't envision Bitcoin, and neither did I. Uh, you know, I like to say that Tim stole a bunch of ideas from me and reprocessed them, and then I stole them back from him, which seems to be the way stuff is supposed to work, in, in my view. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea of crypto anarchy, which he pushed, and which some of the cypherpunks pushed, not all of them, back a long time ago, uh, is an attractive idea, and it might happen. And the NSA is trying very hard to make sure it doesn't happen, and I can understand their I could see it from their standpoint too. And what's really going to happen, I just don't know. That I think the technology, I think insofar as technology is pushing in a direction, is pushing in our direction. On the other hand, as somebody in that conversation said a long time ago, encryption is not your friend. Encryption is just a technology that can be used for a variety of purposes that you do or don't like. And there, there aren't any guarantees out there uh, that information wants to be free or any of that kind of pleasant rhetoric. Uh, so I guess, you know, it, Bitcoin would certainly be very nice. Uh, the version of eCash that I and probably Tim were thinking about was Xiaomi and Digital Cash, which is really a better system than Bitcoin in some ways. In particular, Bitcoin is not anonymous. Bitcoin, may, there may be ways of making it anonymous, but the basic system of Bitcoin is the least anonymous form of currency that has ever existed since every transaction is known to everybody who's using the system. Although you don't know who, you, it's a transaction between accounts, not people, but you can really match them up pretty easily if you spend some time and effort figuring out who's spending money on what. Uh, whereas Xiaomi and Digital Cash was fully anonymous. The problem with Xiaomi and Digital Cash is that you need an issuing bank. So you have to have a bank people will trust, which is issuing the money. And since all important governments are against anonymous digital cash, because if you have fully anonymous digital cash, money laundering laws become unenforceable. And even tax collection gets a little more difficult than it used to be. And it's hard to have a trusted bank in a country whose government hates you uh, or hates the idea of such a bank. And I think that's the reason it hasn't happened yet. The neat thing about Bitcoin is it requires no issuer. So the neat thing about Bitcoin is that it solved that problem by creating a form of money which didn't require a trusted institution to, to, to back it. So hopefully it'll keep working. We'll see. Uh, Justin Davis asks, and this is, you kind of uh, addressed some of this, but what's your opinion regarding our chances to transition into a stateless society and how might you envision
Yeah, I guess my preferred version is the one in which when it happens, you don't notice. That is my preferred version is that more and more of government functions get replaced by private alternatives. And it's not that there's a point at which you abolish government, but there's a point at which government can't collect very much taxes because most transactions are encrypted and invisible to it. And there's a point at which government police really aren't very useful because most people are living in gated communities or they have private security arrangements and, 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 and. And you get a little bit of that in Snow Crash, if you've read it, which is a sort of a fun tongue in cheek science fiction novel in which there are still people who think they're part of the government. They go to work every day, but they aren't really doing anything. Uh, and that's sort of neat. Uh, I don't I don't really like the idea of revolutions because I think that most people see the fundamental function of government as protecting them. And when you're having a revolution, people really want to be protected because there are you know, people hanging from lampposts and people shooting at each other and things like that. And that means that they're going to be in favor of more government, not less. Uh, it's worth noticing, by the way, that the biggest revolution on our side that has ever happened has occurred in China over the last 30 years. And it occurred very quietly that, that, that the biggest country that has ever existed by population went from being communist to capitalist. And it did it without ever announcing that it abandoned communism. That it's still run by the Communist Party of, of, of China. All right. So there's a fascinating book co-authored by Ronald Coase, a very important economist who died recently, about that transition, about how China went capitalist. And it basically happens continuously. The authorities believe in socialism. They have noticed that they've got something wrong. First, these are people who survived the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, and they realized that what, what a hell parts of it were, but that's because they somehow messed up on their socialism. They're still confident that socialism is the right system. After Mao dies, they get to go abroad and see the rest of the world, and they suddenly discover that the oppressed masses in the capitalist world are much better off than the Chinese peasants are. Uh, there, Cao Coast mentions a vice premier of China who goes to visit England, and he discovers that a trash collector in London makes six times his salary. And his final conclusion is England would be the perfect communist society if it only had a communist party running it. So they want to fix things. They don't know how. They believe that what matters is stuff like heavy industry. And the one critical thing they get right is they're willing to believe facts. They're willing to look at what actually happens on the ground. So you have market institutions developing in the parts of the economy they aren't paying attention to. Uh, in particular, uh, small scale business in the cities, uh, things like uh, street food and lots of other things of that sort, and private property in agriculture, which is initially illegal, but is happening covertly. And when they notice it's happening and that it's working, they decide, well, we still don't approve of it. We won't do anything very much about it. And in a few more years, they realize it's really working. They decide they're in favor of it. So you've got this sort of continuous transition, not, of course, to a libertarian society, although I think it's at least arguable that China may be more capitalist than the U.S. at the moment. I think the share of national income spent by the government is smaller, though I could be, be wrong about that. Uh, but that you've got the transition with nobody deciding to do it, but just with things gradually drifting, uh, because the people in charge are not evil people. They don't want their population to starve. That's happened already, and they didn't like it because... Some of them were people who got sent out to, to the peasants to starve with them when they fell out of favor with Mao. Uh, so when they see things work, they're willing to figure out some excuse for allowing them. And the result is that you end up with what's really pretty much a, you know, there's, there are still governments still running some things, but government runs quite a lot of things in the U.S. too. Uh, but it's about as capitalist society as we are. So I, I, I think that kind of revolution, uh, the sort of invisible quiet revolution, is a much better gamble for getting what we want. Uh, you know, if you think about, take schooling, if uh, you move to voucher plans for schooling, which is happening gradually, but it's happening, uh, that means that schooling is still subsidized by the state, but no longer run by the state. Once you get to that point, it becomes more and more attractive to say, look, why should the average person pay $8,000 in and get $8,000 back? How about just going to subsidizing schooling for the poor people? And you can then shift to a system where most of the population is in basically private schooling. Uh, and I think you can see the same sort of thing happening in a lot of other uh, of other contexts. But whether it will happen, I don't know. I don't do problems.
question. Our next question is from Fu. He, he asks, why do people think that it is impossible for private entities to, for example, design and launch a spacecraft or, you know, similar high tech? Yeah, I'm not sure people do believe that anymore, given that SpaceX has done it. Uh, the there's, I think the place where there are serious arguments for government are where you've got things like public good problems. So that it's not absurd to say that a private entity couldn't develop a new technology if it was a technology with once developed everybody could use. Now, it's not clear governments do any better on that. But you can see that there's a real problem when the normal market mechanism, which is I create something that belongs to me, I can charge other people for using it, or I can sell it to other people, doesn't work. And it breaks down with the kinds of things such as knowledge that are very hard to control, very hard to, to treat as property. Uh, so there's a real argument there, uh, whether, I'm not sure I agree with the conclusion, but a real argument. But I don't think there is much of an argument for just saying governments can do big things and private people can't, because lots of big things have been done by, by private enterprise, you know cost a lot of money to design a new computer chip or build a factory uh, to build it. Uh, the original Pennsylvania Turnpike for automobiles, it was, it was a, a wagon road, was built privately. Oh. Um, Justin Davis asks, so uh, what the tongue-in-cheek book you mentioned was, uh, was that Snow Crash that you were talking yeah. about? Snow Crash. Yeah, Neil Snow Stephenson. Crash by Neil Stevenson. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot um, of now, It's a lot of Oh. It's a lot um, of fun. It's a, he isn't taking himself very seriously, but it's a good book. Now, uh, on as a follow-up question on that, do you think that the transition would be as messy as it looks in uh, in Snow Crash, where you know between verb claves you have a kind of chaos? Well, the transition isn't messy. The society might be messy, but but it, it, you don't have the impression that there was some incident in which things blew up. Uh, in that sense, it isn't the transition, yeah. but no, probably not. But after all, he's trying to tell a good story, and uh, you know, it's like it's like the Icelandic sagas. People look at them and they look what a violent society it was. And my wife likes to point out in one of the sagas where you've got a chapter and there's some violence and someone is killed, and in the next chapter there's some more violence and someone is killed, and then you look a little more carefully and you notice that one of the people who participates in the second chapter as an adult wasn't born in the first chapter. So what they've done is to telescope this to make it a good story. They were leaving out the boring bits when nobody was getting killed and just, just hitting the high points, so to speak. And I think that similarly that Stephenson is trying to make it a good, a good story. Uh, the, I should say the other science fiction thing on anarcho-capitalism that I'm particularly prejudiced in favor of is Werner Vinge's short story, The Ungoverned. And I'm prejudiced in favor of that, aside from the fact that Vinge is a friend of mine, because at the end of it, he credits machinery of freedom as the idea for the, society, the fictional society he's describing. And part of what I liked about the story is that an anarcho-capitalist society as envisioned by a novelist has a sort of a color and texture and human feel that the same society envisioned by an economist doesn't have. So that in that sense, I thought he gave a very interesting picture of what the whole thing would feel like. And one of the other things that you see in that story is the way people on both sides of the boundary between the anarcho capital, the stateless, and the, and the state area interpret the other in their own terms. So that the, well, it take too long to summarize the story, but, but there's a point at which somebody in the stateless society does something which the people on the other side see as sort of breaking the rules, as, as beyond the bounds. And, you know, the guy says to, the representative of the local enforcement agency, I mean, how can you do this to us? And the agency, the, the agent looks at him sort of with puzzlement, says, you know, what do you mean us? He's not our customer. Uh, and that the, the state has just been thinking of the stateless area as, as really a state it just pretends not to be. And the stateless guy, of course, takes for granted his own institutions. Now, that was really quite nicely done. I think it's true of, of real societies that everybody tends to take for granted the way they do. For example, I think most Americans take it for granted that law enforcement is done by police. They don't know that there have been a lot. I mean, England didn't have a police force until the 19th to well into the 19th century. Uh, not sure how early the U.S. did. Probably most of it didn't again until sometime in the 19th century. In modern day America, part of the job that's done by the police for criminal law is done by the victim and his lawyer for tort law. That 
You know, if, if, if somebody breaks your arm, you call the cops and they arrest him. If he breaks your window, you call your lawyer and sue him. Uh, so that there's a sense in which everything is sort of seen in the framework of our system. Another question? Uh, Jason Williams asks, how do we break the state's monopolistic control over security without having a violent revolution? Well, we've already broken the monopolistic control. That is to say, there, after all, are lots of people who sell burglar alarms and locks, and there are gated communities with their own security and so forth. And I would say that the way you, you, you break their monopolistic control is mostly by doing the same job better and cheaper. How do we break the monopolist to control of the state over delivering the mail by starting FedEx and UPS? Uh. All right, I'm going to put out a last call for questions here. I want to tell people what's going on uh, this week at Liberty Me. Uh, tomorrow night, we've got the third session of Rick Rule's course on junior mining investment. Friday night, we've got Prepping 101 Bug Out Bags. Uh, Joe Pirelli is going to be teaching people how to create a bag that can get you through the first 72 hours of some kind of big disaster. Uh, Sunday we've got two sessions, uh, 5 p.m. Abortion and Evictionism with Walter Block. He's going to be talking about his theory on uh, abortion. And at 8 p.m. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker is going to be continuing his Liberty Classics series with uh, Socialism by Ludwig von Mises. So I hope to see you back, uh, all, all of you, for as as many of those as you'd like to come for. Uh, we've got one more question here. Uh, actually, two questions now. Uh, who asks, would you say that evolve the tech as fast as you can is a good blanket answer to questions of how to get rid of the state without violence? Uh, no, because some technologies are going to help the state and some are going to hurt the state. And it's not as if anybody decides to evolve the tech. I, I sort of like technology, and I hope it continues to develop. But some technologies are going to make things better, and some are going to make them make them worse. No, I think people would like to believe they're more in control of the world than they are. And I don't think there's something I can do that will eliminate the state. I think I can explore how societies without the state might work. And if enough people are convinced that that's an attractive option, it makes it more likely that when circumstances arise, it'll happen. But I don't think that I don't think one can sort of engineer the future, unfortunately. At least unfortunately I can't. It's fortunate that some other people can. Uh, Julia Patterson asks, how do you envision nuclear weapons being controlled in a stateless society? Another good question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, you could imagine that the private courts would agree on rules which said that if you have a nuclear weapon, you could be sued by your neighbors for imposing an unreasonable risk on them. Uh, I can imagine more plausibly, I think, that people who use nuclear weapons are likely to end up dead because other people are very unhappy about it, so they're not likely to get used very much. But it's hard to see without a state how you would make sure that nobody ever had one. We haven't been very successful with a state. I mean, it's reasonably clear that Iran is going to have nuclear weapons in the not too distant future. I think it's reasonably clear, and quite a lot of states already have them, as we know. Fortunately, they haven't gotten used since uh, the end of World War II. All right, we've got one last question here, and then we're going to call it. Uh, Wesley asks, which technology poses the biggest and most immediate threat to human life, in your opinion? I don't think I can answer that. What I can do is to refer you to my book, Future Imperfect. Or if you like, if you can find the YouTube of the talk that I gave at Google about the book, Future Imperfect, because I think I discuss in that talk uh, several different technologies, each of which could conceivably wipe out human life before the end of the century. Um, sort of start out by saying that I think global warming is a pretty wimpy catastrophe, because I have three different ways of wiping out our species faster than and one of the three is nanotechnology, one of the three is biotechnology, and the third one is artificial intelligence. That if the computers keep getting smarter and we don't, and if, as Kurzweil thinks, in another 20 or 30 years, the computers are at about human level intelligence, then 10 years after that, we're gerbils. And we better hope they like pets. So that's one of the non-obvious but interesting threats.
To which Kurzweil has an interesting answer. We'll get into that. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful and enlightening. Um, everybody should go and check out uh, the new edition of the Machinery of Freedom on Kindle. I'll put the link in chat in just a moment as well. But thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to have you back anytime. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a great night. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Incentives that individuals have that give you a peaceful civil order. And the answer, I think, comes down to a different structure of such commitment strategy. Uh, furthermore, this way of looking at rights also fills out a point I made in the first edition, where I asked the question of what, why do we call some things governments and not others? Why do we say, after all, everything you can think of that governments do have been done by some private organization at some time in, in history? So what's the difference? And the definition I offered there was that a government was an agency of legitimized coercion. And I tried to explain that I was using both words in special senses, which I tried to, to fill out in, in that chapter. You can go back and look at the, at the chapter if you like. Uh, but I think I can now explain more precisely that the government is an agency against which we drop the commitment strategies that protect our rights against violations by other people. That usually, going back many steps, when I say you have a right to, some, to something in this sense, what I really mean is other people will find that it is not in their interest uh, to violate it. That that's the real substance of rights is some set of behavior, in this case your commitment strategy, such as it's not in other people's interest to steal from you, kill you, or whatever. It usually isn't, nothing, nothing is perfect. So that's the first chunk, what I think of as the positive account of rights. And I think it helps explain human societies and helps explain how governments are different. And then an anarchist is somebody who supports a society which has no agency of legitimized coercion, which has no organization which can do things that would be treated as rights violation if anybody else did. Second, in the time since uh, the book was originally published, Machinery was published in the first edition about 40 years ago, I think the second something like 20 years ago. Uh, and there are really two sorts of material in the book. There are about four different chunks which expand on, modify, sort of fill out ideas that were in the original book. And then there are a number of other chapters uh, which do other additional things. And what I'll probably be doing tonight is trying to sketch the four chapters then list the others and we can see what people want to talk about. Uh, and I start out with what I think of as a positive account of rights. Most people think of rights either as a moral category or as a legal category. That I have a right not to be killed either means it is wrong for you to kill me or it means that if you kill me you'll get arrested and bad things will happen to you. And I think it's useful to see rights in neither of those terms, but rather to see them as a description of how human beings behave. Not only human beings, we'll see in a minute, but human beings in particular. So that's why I think of it as a positive account. And I want to start out by pointing out that property rights not only are not a creation of government, as people often claim, they predate our species. That there is a form of property rights that exists in quite a lot of non-human species. And I want to argue that when you understand that, it will help you to understand rights in general among humans. And the property rights among mostly birds and fishes are what are referred to as territorial behavior. And the basic way it works is that an animal somehow marks a territory which it's claiming. And uh, you correctly calculate that retaliating against him is going to cost you more than $10 a month. And yet I predict with some confidence that you aren't going to agree to, to his extortion. Uh, and the reason is that you, like the bird or fish, have drawn certain lines. These are not, not always geographical lines, but there are certain lines such that you have somehow emotionally committed yourself that if someone crosses those lines, you will fight him harder than the amount at stake seems to be worth. Not infinitely hard, 
somebody uh, might violate what you see as your rights and you might back down because you're afraid you'll get killed if you don't. Uh, we don't all fight muggers. But you are willing to fight muggers or the equivalent even if fighting them costs you $30 and giving in costs you $10. And the reason you're committed to that strategy, of course, is that if other members of your species realize you're so committed, they don't threaten to dump trash over your fence or in other ways violate your rights. So I want to claim that the system of rights in human society is simply an elaborate network of mutually recognized commitment strategies. Uh, and that that explains a good deal about how human societies work. In particular, it answers a puzzle that's implicit in Thomas Hobbes' famous description of the state of nature as a war of each against all. Uh, and Hobbes says the solution is to have a sovereign, an all-powerful king. But the question is, how do you get it? Because after all, once you've set up your government to enforce rights, the people in that government are just people. They're acting like anybody else. The fact that somebody is wearing a policeman's uniform doesn't make him enforce the law. The fact that words are written in books doesn't make people enforce the law. What changes in the turns a switch in its brain, metaphorically speaking, which commits itself to fight more and more desperately against a trespasser of its own species, the deeper he comes into the claim territory. And what's driving the, the mechanism is that a fight to the death is usually a loss for both sides. Uh, unless the trespasser is much bigger and stronger than the defender, uh, by the time the defender is dead, the trespasser is going to be hurt. And therefore, if the trespasser knows that the defender will fight to the death, it pays the trespasser to back off. And most of the time, not always, it works. So that in territorial animals, you actually get an effective claiming of territory by individuals uh, within the species. Uh, and I want to claim that rights in humans amount to a much more elaborate version of the same of the same mechanism. And I find it useful to tell the following story to try to illustrate my point. Uh, imagine that you are living in some suburban neighborhood with a not very well organized uh, government, uh, not very efficient or reliable. And one day your neighbor calls you over to the fence. And he tells you that he's decided that taking his trash to the dump is a real pain. So from now on, he's going to dump it over the fence into your, into your yard. And when you finish uh, collecting your thoughts and, and suggest to him that he ought not to do that, he calmly explains to you that getting the local authorities to do anything about it will be a great deal of trouble, take you a lot of time and effort to get them to move and convince them that it's really his trash and so forth. Uh, and that it's less trouble for you to just take his trash and dump it, take it to the dump. But he's willing to offer you a better alternative. If you'll pay him 10 bucks a month, he'll agree not to do it. And the question is why you turn down this very generous offer. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Liberty Me You. We're here tonight with Dr. David Friedman. Uh, he's going to be talking about the third edition of his wonderful book, The Machinery of Freedom. Uh, many of us here have probably already read it, and Dr. Friedman needs no introduction, but for those uh, in this uh, community who might not know who he is, he's an economist, physicist, legal scholar, and libertarian theorist. He's known for his writings in market anarchist theory, but also has uh, several other excellent books, including uh, Price Theory and Intermediate Text, Hidden Order, the Economics of Everyday Life, and what we were just talking about uh, before we started there, Law's Order, What Economics Has to Do with Law and Why It Matters. Uh, the Machinery of Freedom has been very influential within the libertarian movement in showing people how a society without a monopoly on law uh, might be, might, uh, might order itself, and it's it's been wonderful in, in, as a resource text in, in, for thinking about how some of these issues might be confronted. And it's been tremendously influential in my intellectual development. And I'm very excited to present to you Dr. David Friedman. Hello, everybody. <laughs> 
machinery is available as a Kindle on Amazon at a extremely low price, since I write books mainly to spread ideas, not mainly as a source of income. Uh, in the third edition, I'm really doing two things, both of them involving ideas I've had and to some extent written about.